That's perfect. And <laughs> already have the the next team here, so I'll just bring them on the stage. Hello, hi. So we have uh, oh, Aizé, we have Aizé, here, Ada, Levan, and Robert. Welcome, yes. welcome to the yes. stage. Yes. We are. We see you, and it's so good. We were mentioning when we were having the discussions with the communities that if you can, then please sort of do be in the same place because mm -hmm. that sort of brings uh, um, some some variety to the Zoom kind of uh, way that we've been experiencing life in, in, the, uh, in the recent months and years. Thank so you. Thank you. This. So before we hand you over um, their uh, participants to IXA Hong Kong and uh, their tips for designing for Chinese content, uh, you know, a few um, important things. This is the stage where you will have the live coverage 24 hours. Um, and uh, after each of the talks, you will have a little uh, breakout uh, discussion in the sessions tab on the left side. So you can click on the sessions after the talk if you want to ask more questions and so on. Um, and um, other than that, we also have a mirror. So at the very bottom of the uh, the left hand, you see the 24 hours of UX mirror board. So you can join that for your various types of um, uh, engagements and uh, duties and information available to you to interact with and engage with. And uh, also, if you um, um, if you're watching, then do take a screenshot or a photo of you watching 24 hours of UX and please do share it in social. We always see a lot of people uh, learning about the event during the event through you, the participants. Uh, so it's uh, it would be great to be able to share the information with and the knowledge here with more and more people. So please do that. And uh, because uh, this uh, talk, uh, Tips for Designing for Chinese Content, is only 30 minutes long, uh, I will hand over the stage uh, to Ada, Lovain, and Robert. Uh, and um, we will be here, um, to, so just saying to Ada, Lovain, and Robert, we'll be here in the, uh, the backstage, so in the private chat, you can ask us any questions. And uh, we will help you at the end uh, with the Q&A as well. So uh, please... Uh, the stage is all yours. Thank you. Um, thanks, Peter, Donna, and the rest of your team, uh, especially for organizing this um, event and inviting us to join. Um, this topic is um, tips for designing Chinese content, right? Um, have you ever been asked to create a Chinese version for your design? If you only ask a copywriter or a translator to convert the original content to Chinese, your audience, Chinese audience, would probably be not satisfied. Um, before we talk about this topic, um, I'd like to introduce our community, the IXDA Hong Kong, the Hong Kong chapter of the Interaction Design Association. It was founded in 2006, so which means it was even it was born before the term use experience. Um, we have been running uh, regularly, uh, running seminars and workshops, and we also experimented with um, several um, mentorship program, um, design challenge, and hackathons. Um, to find out more about our activities, I will share um, our links on Facebook and um, LinkedIn um, in the comment sessions later, the chat session later. And um, one more thing before we pass the stage to our speakers, um, if you have any questions about the topic, um, please do um, put down um, your questions in the chat sessions or the Q&A. Um, we love questions, and we will discuss your questions at the end of the sharing. So now, um, let's welcome Lewin and Robert. Hello, everyone. <laughs> uh, let me briefly introduce myself. I have been doing uh, user experience design for 20 years, starting as a user researcher. I came from a cognitive science background. I'm always interested to look at how we can leverage technology to bridge the human gaps. My career focus at the moment is on service design, which is to bring design thinking into the organization, help people to transform and help the project team to co-create. And I also love culture and people. And I learned that in this forum, there's no one coming representing Hong Kong last year. So I grabbed my friend Robert and to come to join, uh, to, 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 to create a session together. And we want to share about the culture and language 
uh, for in Asia, for Chinese and Hong Kong. And that's why we are here today. Robert. Sure. Thanks, Alan. I'm Robert. I'm from the Digital Experience and Accessibility team in HSBC. So for those you don't know HSBC, HSBC is a financial institution. Uh, we operate in 64 markets, over 40 million, serving over 40 million customers. Uh, so we, Hong Kong is one of our home market. That's why we do a lot of multilingual design. And today I just want to share with you, you know, my decades of experience working on multilingual projects, all the so-called tips and challenges that I face are like real example from real projects. So hopefully that will shed some light on and give some inspiration for all the fellow designers. Okay, let me start with the sharing. Yep, just uh, we're going to, okay, come your computer. Hold on, we're looking for the files. Oh, sure. Screen. Oh, window. Yes, this one. Okay. We're back. All right. <laughs> Since we are all coming from Hong Kong, so I can not stop not telling you a bit about Hong Kong. Hong Kong is located in the Southeast Asia along the coastline of Pacific Ocean. It's officially called Hong Kong Spe Special Administrative region, which is part of the China, as you can tell from in the map. Hong Kong is also a financial hub and a trading port, which connect the East and the West. So today we are also very curious how many people here who have been to Hong Kong, visited Hong Kong, traveled to Hong Kong. If so, can you share, uh, just share what you, uh, about Hong Kong with us in the chat room, please? And um, yeah, so here's a some photos of Hong Kong. Um, Hong Kong has a lot of high rise and it's called, uh, we also have a wet nest night. People uh, can work very long hours. And we are also famous for low unemployment rates. In terms of language, we use Cantonese, which is a Chinese dialect in our day, for our day-to-day -day communication. But we also use English a lot, both at work and in school. Hong Kong was a colony of Britain uh, before 1997. That shaped the multicultural we have today. The city, uh, we think the city is a really good example to serve, to, exp to help you to explain how the use of language uh, to interwise with the culture and history. So here is one example. Uh, this is a classic poster uh, from Star Wars. As you can tell um, on the localization, when the Star Wars poster being localized for for the Hong Kong market, uh, for the Chinese market, and you, which is way beyond just translating the English into Chinese. Uh, you can see we supplement a lot of details and make the page full of information. If you look at the Chinese portal or many of the shopping site for Chinese, you also notice that Chinese user, they like to put a lot of things uh, on the on the one screen and in one view. This is the this which is very different from the Western culture uh, that they like to focus on one thing yeah. and with one theme. So this is a culture different we want to share with you. So when you say Chinese content, so please start thinking that it's not just about doing Google Translate. There's much more that you need to consider. You need to think about the culture and also the user behavior. So we're going to show you more about the different tips on this. All right, thank you, Lauren. So first, before I begin, I want to give you a primer on what is Chinese. So I put together this sort of like a, a cheat, cheat sheet uh, so that you can at one go that uh, can understand three aspects of Chinese. So you can see four big characters on the screen. Uh, so on the left column, you see two characters, which is simplified Chinese. And on the right, also two characters. Uh, in traditional Chinese. 
that also show you that there are two written form of Chinese, simplified Chinese and traditional Chinese. Traditional Chinese is the Chinese that's been used for thousands of years, and simplified Chinese only uh, created around the 50s. Uh, so it's very new. Uh, the four character uh, are exactly meaning the same thing. It means leaf or it's a surname. Now, if you break down into the four quadrant, so you can see in China, we use simplified Chinese. Uh, the spoken language is actually dialect, it's actually Mandarin. Same for Malaysia and Singapore. But you look at the right column in Hong Kong and Macau, we use traditional Chinese for written form, but we speak in Cantonese. In Taiwan, use traditional Chinese in written form, but in Mandarin. Now you can already see the confusion, right? Especially two example. Hong Kong, Macau is part of China, but we use traditional Chinese as written form, but speak in Cantonese. In China, they written in simplified Chinese and Mandarin. So it's like no one fit, one size fit for all. And the confusion also is if you go to Hong Kong uh, and go to Taiwan, you can see the written Chinese is actually the same. However, the spoken form is different. That means that you can read, but probably you can't tell or listen to, to what is being said in, in either country. The third aspect is actually culture. So there's a cultural uh, underlying differences between the, the different languages. Uh, for in China, like there's the same uh, action called like hailing a cab. For taxi in China, we call it da te, da di. In Hong Kong, it's actually in Cantonese, we call it da dixi. In Malaysia, Singapore is actually a mix between the two. It's actually in Mandarin, but called Da Di Si. In Taiwan, they don't call Di Si a taxi. They call it Ji Shen Che. So as you can see, there's actually three angles you need to consider when you're doing Chinese content. One is the written form, which uh, we, we have two, traditional Chinese and simplified Chinese. For the spoken form, if you're doing video or other multimedia, you have to consider whether it should be in Mandarin or Cantonese, and also, or the content itself in context, which terms you should be using. So now we set the scene, you know, you can see the confusion and complicated what, what was in, can be in, in Chinese. Let's get into some of the nitty gritty about design. So first I want to talk about space orientation and line break. So on the left side, you see this meme. It actually shows a very interesting aspect of Chinese character. So Chinese can be written in horizontal form and also in vertical form. That's why spacing is very important. In this example, it's a road sign, but as you can see the spacing around each character are the same. So you can't really tell whether they are like two rows or two columns. That's why it's very confusing because it makes sense if you read it horizontally, it also makes sense if you read it vertically. But as this is a road sign, it basically ended up in two very different destinations. So that's about space and orientation. Moving on to the right, it's actually showing a couple of uh, very localized uh, uh, usage that you need to understand. Because one of the big things about Chinese is there's no space between words. In fact, one word in Chinese can consist of one, two, three, or even four, more than three char characters. So as you can see in here, if you're doing design, like a graphic design, doing a headline, there are a couple of things that you probably need to, to, to be aware. Like the big highlight here, the first uh, block of text, you can, see, you can see that the red boxes I highlight is actually one special term. This is basically like a product name. So it would be good if you can keep them in one line, either by rewriting it or basically, you know, not having a justified uh, way of, of uh, laying out the content. The second row is also another big no-no, is to avoid starting a line with a punctuation. This is, uh, so if you're doing a design in Chinese, make sure that doesn't happen. The third row is actually quite logical, but a lot of people didn't realize, is don't create an often. Often means that it's only like one thing on, on a row. Either it's a character or a punctuation. In this case, it's a punctuation. So if, if you're doing a graphic design, try to have someone that speak Chinese to help you understand the context, whether that's a special term, how to avoid uh, having a punctuation or often. 
However, the challenge comes in, in digital space. Because in digital space, if you're creating like a, a responsive design, often you can control it. But all in all, there's no hard rules in line breaking in Chinese. However, it does affect readability and aesthetic. So something to be considered. Now, now the second one is very interesting. Have you ever sought sort of like Chinese, how to sort in Chinese? Actually, there are a couple of ways. In China, uh, people sort it under pinyin, which is a romanization. But what is romanization? Basically, Hong Kong in English called Hong Kong, but in romanization, it's actually Shanghai. So even though they start with a Latin word, but uh, it starts differently. So Hong Kong start with an H, uh, Shanghai start with an X. So that's why uh, a lot of the uh, sorting order in China doesn't make sense to people outside of China. But as, as I start earlier, uh, Hong Kong and Taiwan doesn't use pinyin. That means we also use another way of sorting, usually number of stroke to sort. And if you see this example on screen, it's even a different way. Basically, they're building a website, probably using CMS to capture the, the content. So they basically list out in an alphabetical uh, list and just translate it. So for, a China, for, for someone that doesn't know English, the Chinese side makes no sense to them because it's not follow pinyin sorting order nor a number of strokes. So something to, to be considered, you know, whether you really want to, in a multilingual scenario, do you really want to use a sort list or maybe a predictive text box? The third aspect is about uh, spacing again. So as you can see in, in rule of thumb, uh, Chinese usually the same content uh, will be like one third shorter than English. So if you are designing something like a doormat navigation, you have to understand that you know the, the English version and Chinese version, uh, the spacing will be very different. So in this case, you can see on, on the Chinese side, we have a lot of white space, whereas on the English side, uh, we have a lot of text. And also in this unique example, we also show another design challenges. What if some of the content are only available in Chinese? So what do you do on the English one? Now, granted, this is not a particular challenge or issue for Chinese content. It's basically apply, can apply for multilingual uh, scenario. However, this is also one of the interesting things for you to consider, especially if you're selling product in China. A lot of the time, you only have Chinese content, which doesn't have English. So how do you deal with it uh, when you're building a navigation? Do you skip it? Or do you, like this in scenario, keep the navigation in Chinese uh, in, in, on the English side, but put in the, uh, uh, emphasis that those information are in Chinese only? I don't have any solution. Uh, still trying to figure it out. So if, if anybody in the audience have idea, you know, share with us through the comment. The last aspect I want to share is actually quite technical. It's about encoding and font. So as I bring up earlier, we actually have two different written form in Chinese. One is traditional and one is simplified. And they actually have two different encoding uh, method. Even though we have Unicode that kind of align all the font into one font family. However, if you look at the example here, the two identical character actually have two uh, or the different Unicode code. The reason is between uh, traditional Chinese and simplified Chinese, their relationships are not mutually exclusive. And also the mapping is different. That means that the same character can happen, uh, appear in both. And then also one simplified Chinese can map to multiple traditional Chinese. And this case usually happen if you have a document in traditional Chinese or simplified Chinese and you use like Microsoft Word to do a conversion into the other uh, written, uh, the, the, the other form, usually sometimes you will end up have some uh, missing character in between. That's because uh, the encoding change and the system that's not smart enough to match the same character in another encoding. Also for designer, especially like about aesthetic and, and, and UI, you also need to understand that uh, some of the font foundry create font for Taiwan, Hong Kong, and, and China are actually rendered differently. That's the example on the right. As you can see, uh, people still can understand it. However, the rendering, the aesthetic of each character are actually different. 
So just to recap, so China, Chinese is not only like one size fit all. And also there's a lot of technical aspect that you need to consider, not just to, to, to look at the, the content and, uh, and all the uh, uh, scenario that, that, you know, just like Loan said, you know, find, uh, find, find uh, the English one and then just, you know, you use some automated tool to translate into Chinese that most of the time doesn't work. So, you know, back to you, Loan. <laughs> okay. All right. So now we'd like to wrap up with these final tips. Know your users. Um, so on the screen, you can see two examples. On the left, which is a trading stock trading platform. So can you spot anything interesting about this stock trading app? Right. It is about the use of color. In China, Red actually means dangerous or bad or going down. But in for many places, including Hong Kong and many Western countries, red actually means good and going up. So if you consider when you design um, things like a trading platforms to show something going up or going down, then if this is uh, the your target audience is for Chinese, then you need to consider what color to use to represent the message. And even better is that you allow the user to choose. Like right? on the on the on the right screen, you can see that there's a control panel for user to select whether red means good up or down. Yeah. Yeah. So so this will help your users uh, to understand the information according to their culture. And on the right hand side, um, it is a photo uh, being published in the Guardian, the news portal in UK early this year. The photo is is a um, supplement for a recipe uh, you uh, share for the Chinese New Year. I think many of Chinese when they when you see this screen, you will probably will feel already feel upset because they put the Josh paper as a decoration. For Chinese, George paper actually means something uh, unlucky or cursed as because, because this is being used uh, together with uh, uh, death rituals or to people burn it to the, the people, burn it for the people who have passed away. So this is, sim this is to symbolize something which is bad, not good. And if you put it together uh, for a dish, which is to celebrate a festival, which is a very um, inappropriate and very rude. And so the I think the news portal, uh, they, after they post it and uh, very quickly, they hear feedback and immediately remove, uh, change the photo and take away the George paper. So, so what we're trying to show it here is that the Chinese, the content is not just about the translation. We also need to know the culture and the and the the user uh, the user behavior, and the the best way to do this uh, not only just to learn about all this culture is when you have your content ready, you test it with your target users, and get and show it to them and get to know whether this is what they will use it in their in their day to day then it will be much safer. So that's all our sharing today. Uh, Ada, do we have any questions on? Yeah, we do. Um, I've collected a few questions. Um, one of the audience want to know, like uh, for the red and green um, difference, does it only apply to the stock market or like financial industry? Difference between uh, red and green? I think that that's a more, more like a more obvious case, but, but in general, I think uh, red a lot of times means lucky. So in cultural context, uh, like in Chinese New Year, we use a lot of red. However, red sometimes like uh, in a digital sense that you use it for alert. So that's contextually, you know, they have some conflict. Uh, however, how, how do you resolve it? It's, it's not like just, just you know a checkbox you know oh always avoid using red it's not like the case uh so so the, the short answer is 
the reason the red and green happens is because of the stock market is associated with money and red associated with good luck. So it become mixed into like one issue. However, I, I don't think it's a unique to stock market uh, because in other places, I think uh, people still use a lot of red uh, yeah. more than other cu culture, I would say. And the interesting part is that like Hong Kong, we are also Chinese, right? But the, 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 the use of these color, um, we're more in following the Western, Western. way. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Okay. There are like some technical questions that um, someone like to ask. Um, so about like, um, since the coding, yeah, coding is, there's a difference between uh, the different like simplified Chinese yeah. and traditional Chinese. Yeah. So does it make a difference when you do SEO? Do you need to do one set for um, simplified Chinese and one set for traditional Chinese? Well, I think encoding does may not have a direct impact mm -hmm. on SEO, but when, when you are like, it, it's all more, more associated with like, the use of font because the encoding and the usually because Chinese font are such in a large size. So usually the, the font foundry will split that out like the traditional Chinese font and the, uh, and, and the simplified Chinese font. And if you somehow apply a traditional Chinese font onto a simplified Chinese document, then the issue will have a conflict because the encoding can find the, the mm. correct word from that font. That, that means that you will see some holes in between or some weirdness will, will happen. But uh, I don't think it, it actually affect SEO in a way, at least not in my knowledge, you know, happy to, to be challenged or be, be, you know, corrected if the audience knows more than me. Okay, cool. Um, I think like uh, I'm seeing some questions posted in Q and A, and we also collected some questions in the chat area. So uh, please do post your questions. Uh, if necessary, we can move to the, um, to the session um, after um, after this session ends. So uh, just click on the third icon to go to the sessions. Uh, at the meantime, I let, let us talk about um, some questions in the Q&A area. Uh, one person asked like, when you are creating a product in a multi-language environment, um, how do you manage the difference in like uh, content? Is it a tough question? I think we need to understand who are the target users. First thing, we need to know who are your target users. Yeah, even in Hong Kong, like we are uh, using a mix of English and Chinese, right? But for different professions, like doctor, they use English a lot. But like for lo local people, yeah, mm, then then you go to restaurants, then then we we will have a both a Chinese. If you go to very local restaurants, the Chinese will be the the key language. Mm. But if you go to a French restaurant or a more high-end restaurant, English may be used. So it really depends a lot on the on the context and and who are your target customers. I think one of the example I can give you is for our bank. The the the, uh, the 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 metric may not be the most updated one, but I think if I remember correctly, I think the usage is uh, in Hong Kong seventy percent use Chinese and thirty percent use English. That means that it's okay to to be having things that across two languages. However, in China, like old for 95% uh, actually only use the Chinese one. In fact, if you go to WeChat, all the mini program and most of the channel are in Chinese only, even for the luxury brand. So China probably, you know, uh, you want to have like entire Chinese content. So even for a multilingual environment, there, in, in most cases, they may have a dominant uh, uh, language or a dominant side of things that you need to consider. Uh, so know your audience. If you are selling for a particular material or particular product in a certain market, who is your target audience? Which market you want to break in, into it? And, and you know, do the best on the primary or, or the dominant side of things and then treat the other one more like a, like a translation. That would be easier, uh, but in some case, if if you want to have a, like a true bilingual or multilingual uh, experience, yeah, you probably need. It's, first of all, you need technically more complicated and also expensive. For example, you probably need to end up with like two sets of CSS. CSS, so the kernel and spacing of the text can be different. Like for example, the example I showed earlier, like the navigation. Imagine that you can have you you have the luxury to have two sets of CSS. For the Chinese one, you can actually have a larger font, uh, more spacing in between character. Then visually, it may look more harmonized between the English one and, and the Chinese one. However, a lot of the time, because uh, we have like 
technical challenges or budget constraint. We can only build one website, just pull content from different CMS. That means that we have to stick with one set of CSS. That's why we have the same design for English and Chinese. So, you know, as you can imagine, one side has to suffer. So there are like different aspects you, you need to consider, you know, time, budget, and also your audience. Okay, cool. Um, we still have like two minutes. Um, let's ask a simple question, and then I think we probably need to go to the um, Q and A. Like, uh, stay tuned. Um, the easy question is like, uh, what color would you recommend to use for error messages? Well, actually, it's still red. Mm -hmm. I, I, okay. Like that, that, thats the tricky part because. Actually, you know, if you know HSBC logo, we, we, we have a we have a red logo. And actually, in China, people will challenge us like, why you use red logo, right? But but I think you know, also one of the things is people do learn about the, in the digital world. Red means to learn. Mm -hmm. So you, you change that actually maybe you causing more problem than try to create a new standard, right? So so I wouldn't change it. However, color alone is not only the only indication. You need mm -hmm. to consider the icon and also red, because if you look at digital accessibility, just using a color to indicate alert is not enough. Can you imagine like for a color blind person, you know, can't, they can't even tell whether it's red or green or, or, or other color, right? So, so red can still be used because of the experience people learn in the digital world. However, don't just use red to alert color, mm -hmm. use additionally a text or an icon. Very good. Um, <clears throat> there are so many questions on this. I think that, uh, you know, not to mention if there was a project on my hand where I needed to do this, I'd have a ton more. And uh, if you have questions as well, then you can follow the uh, uh, the Hong Kong team over to, the to their session and ask the questions there. So what we're doing in the background is we're copying the still unanswered questions into the chat there in the session. So you'll be able to see those questions there as well. And Hong Kong team, thank you very much for your presentation and, and for your thoughts. Really uh, interesting and insightful. I think that this uh, you know, is a, a large topic and we had a very good sort of brief introduction to the amazing complexities in it. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.